or I guess good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Colvin. I'm the Public Programs Curator here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Welcome to all of you here in the Farley Auditorium joining us, and welcome to all of you online joining us via our Facebook or YouTube channel. I have a few quick announcements before we begin. My primary one is I want to invite you all back here next Thursday as our Food for Thought series continues with Victoria Ott, who will discuss yeoman farmers in, her, uh, in the Civil War during her presentation, The Failure of Our Fathers, Family, Gender, and Power in Confederate Alabama. This series is in conjunction to our current temporary exhibition, Alabama Radio Moments, which is open on our second floor. It'll be open through May 2023, so if you haven't come to see it yet, please come down to the archives and visit the Alabama Radio Moments exhibit. This exhibit and series is made possible by the Friends of the Alabama Archives, Alabama Historic Radio Society, the Alabama Broadcast Association, and the Alabama Humanities Alliance. So thank you to all of our partners for helping us make this possible. Now on to today's speaker. Kevin Nutt is a collections archivist here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. He studied African and African-American culture and critical media history at Hunter College City University of New York and English and history at Auburn University Montgomery. Since 2001, he has produced and hosted the weekly vintage gospel radio program, Sinners Crossroads on Jersey City's WFMU. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Nutt. Pressure's on. Um, I want to thank uh, Alex and John and Scotty, Eugene, who um, radio, if it's a, a radio program, it has had feedback. And um, uh, for letting me talk today. And also I wanted to recognize my colleagues, staff here, whose work I greatly admire and respect. So thanks for thanks for coming. A couple of things. I'm gonna be talking about black gospel, calling it black gospel. Uh, with no apologies. Southern gospel, which I'm not gonna be talking about, is usually meant to refer to white gospel. And now there's hillbilly gospel, mainly because collectors, uh, rockabilly collectors from the UK, record collectors, collections archivist, uh, that's not record collecting. And records here is not these records. It is these records. It's not the archival records, just to clear that up. But uh, rockabilly collectors, collectors uh, often set taste and tones, uh, um, give people signs that this particular type of music is interesting. Uh, for example, um, uh, cassettes never really went away. Vinyl went away. Did you know there's a vinyl resurgence? People would say vinyl never went away. Cassettes, cassettes never went away. People put putting out music on cassettes. It's collectors uh, that usually initiate this. And um, so I unapologetically black gospel. Now that doesn't mean there are people like Charles Johnson, uh, Ted Huffman and the gems that sing white uh, Southern gospel. And there are also white boys that sing, you know, black gospel idiom. And if you go to Pentecostal churches in Kentucky, you will hear whole congregations, white congregations that are singing in the current quartet style idiom. It's really fascinating. So there's not, there's kind of a gray area there with the, the racial line, but I wanted to say that first because uh, uh, those are the terms I'll be using. And uh, also for those of you who don't know, this is a 45 RPM record, okay? I DJ out at Leroy Lounge in Old Cloverdale and I'm always surprised. I'm ready to be surprised, uh, but I'm still surprised that uh, people don't know what that is. And the, the, the uh, advantage of playing 45 RPM records, original pressings is it's the original mix. The people that recorded it, it's for example, in 19, 
72. It's 1972 ears. You can have the same producer, the same engineer remaster this record now, but their ears have changed. I don't want to hear remastered records. DJs d don't want uh, remastered records. We want the original record. And also probably mixed for uh, um, jukeboxes, which means it's a little bass heavy, which we like. This is a 78 RPM record, which preceded the 45s. 78s, 78 RPM, revolution per minute. The, the fidelity between 45s and 78s and LPs, this is by far the best because it's spinning faster. The grooves, the music in the grooves is spread out. That's why tape, when it goes faster, sounds better. Records sound better when they go faster. This is Dixie Airs, by the way. This is really rare record, the collector in me. And then this is an LP, long player, 33 and a third record. Let's review, there'll be a test. It's also a, a collection of the Alabama Blind Boys pre-specialty records recording for the gospel label in Philadelphia, 1947 and 1948. And if you look at, uh, if you look at the, um, the track here, the track listing here, uh, whoops, you will not see this record because no one had a copy of it when this collector uh, produced compilation was put out. But it was found uh, about eight years ago by a collector here in Montgomery who works at Archives and History. <laughs> I, I, don't get a, I don't get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, a charge out of bragging about having the only known copy of a record, but uh, to have a Blind Boys record that's never shown up. And then I uh, put it online and no one really cared. It, it means a lot to me. And then this is Joey, do you remember George? Do you remember these? Yes. That's right. It's an album that people would put their 78s in. Uh, 1930s, 1940s. That's where the term album originated. This is a 78 RPM album, so we still call releases albums. It's from this. This is all uh, Hank Williams' uh, records in here as a... Uh, uh, Good luck. I'll put it in there. Good luck. And this was actually yesterday was uh, uh, repaired by uh, my colleague, Carrie, very because it wouldn't open. It has archival repairing on it. Okay, so we got the nomenclature. We got the records. And now we're going to have the quote from Mr. George Howell. He posted this on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and it just floored me. Uh, what was the original post, George? Do you remember? What? Yeah, that, I got this off. You, you, it was a reply on Facebook. Do you? It was something about gospel that I'd posted. Yeah. Well, George uh, wrote this. Kevin, I wish you could have heard what I heard on WRMA 950 in Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. That station was upstairs in a building in the middle block of Commerce Street, today's hotel space. I was in grammar school, just some kid playing with the radio. I love that. Just some kid playing with the radio. Magnificent. On Sunday mornings, they had gospel groups live in the studio. The groups might have a guitar or a piano, and the group members clapped their hands. I'm guessing it was done with one mic with the lead voice leaning in and out and the rest of the group circled round. I think gospel groups got about 15 minutes each. I don't remember how long the whole show lasted each Sunday. It may have been sponsored by a funeral home. It was some of the rawest music you could ever hear. Yes, yes. I doubt there are any recordings of it. You're wrong. <laughs> a man named Jasper Boswell was in a group that sang live. He worked for my father as a log truck driver, George Hull. 
who's here today, musician. This, this really says everything I'm going to talk about today. But uh, the gospel record, I'm the only one who I have. And uh, the last thing I need to do before I get started is uh, Reverend Azir Espy. It's spiritualist, uh, I don't want to say hoodoo, psychic reader healers that would have commercials on gospel radio because that's where the, the uh, clientele was. Christian people hated to see, hear that, you know. But that's where that's where their their customers came from. So you would hear these uh, uh, commercials on AM gospel radio stations. This is one of the I recorded this off uh, WZTN in 1988. Um, radio station later owned by Reverend Al Dixon. George was filling me in on it. And uh, Reverend Azir would come on. He would want you to call. He he would send you. Uh, uh, he would burn candles for you, fetishes, this kind of thing, uh, which I, I think is, was fascinating and very cool. And I want everyone right now that stands in need of a spiritual blessing right now. Softly. Stands in need of a financial blessing. They got a bill need to be paid. I want everyone right now just come and lay your hands on the radio because I'm going to make contact with my Savior. I'm going to make contact with my bread maker. I'm going to make contact with my blesser. I want you right now to bring the bill to lay them on the radio. If you got a son or a daughter with your jail in prison, you can't break them. Just bring knowledge of them. Do what we have. They just bring knowledge of you. Yes, sir. And lay your hands on the radio because I'm going to bring it. And God knows you're going to you're gonna feel the prayer. Yes. You're going to feel the spirit. Mm-hmm. Come on right now. Right. Lay your hands on the radio. Right now, people, Lord Jesus yes. Christ of Nazareth, this is your son. I feel oh, talking to you. The- you feel better? How can you know? That's amazing radio. This is what you don't hear on commercial radio. It's uh, with the same 10, 10 songs being played over and over. The interesting local community uh, connections, community radio, uh, amateurs, semi-professionals were on the AM radio dial. And to this day, some of them are, are still on the radio dial. It's where the action's at. Uh, for example, um, uh, Roscoe Miller's uh, big KD station, 1027. At 4 o'clock on every Sunday afternoon, you can hear uh, Spanish-language Mexican programming, rancheras, conjuntos, uh, bandas, baladas, uh, bachatas, cumbias. On the radio, local radio, no one knows about it. This is, uh, I took this picture yesterday. This is the WHHY Studios, right? Right, George? Norman, Norman, uh, Norman Bridge Road, after they moved from the Frank Lou building. The reason I went to take this picture, WHHY 1440, is because I started collecting records when I was in second grade. And I listened to 1440. A, I think it's because my sister, I hate to say that, my sister told me to listen to the station. I had a transistor radio that I listened to all of the Atlanta Braves baseball games on. And they also had top 40 programming, the 1969 to 1975 top 40 one-hit wonder pre-disco, pre-FM radio format. The very first record I bought at Bellis S on the Southern Bypass, 75 cents plus three cents tax. My allowance was 75 cents, and I had to come up with the three cents to pay for the tax. I'm not sure how I did that, but um, uh, the very first record I bought was... Uh, Credence Clearwater Revival's Who Will Stop the Rain. And on the flip side, I still have it. I still play it at Leroy uh, every now and then. Is a traveling band, which introduced me to Little Richard because it's just a straight Little Richard rocker. But uh, I had this transistor radio, and I taped it with electrical tape onto my bicycle to ride around South Lawn Estates where I grew up. And so I was riding one day, and tried to pop up on the curb to the side while lost control of my bicycle. Handlebars went this way, skin my knees or whatever. I got back on my bike and I was riding around and listening to the radio WHHY. And I was like, I haven't heard this song before. The next song came on. I said, I haven't heard that song. (laughs) 
the when I wrecked, the wheel on the transistor radio had gone all the way to the right side of the dial, and that's how I discovered 1600 WRMA WXVI. I didn't, I didn't, and I didn't know that there were other stations that played music that WHHY didn't play. It, it never occurred to me. So uh, several years later, I had a paper route in South Lawn, and I would set my clock radio Saturday, Sunday mornings to wake me up 445 in the morning, and I would set it to WXVI. And the first morning, I guess, uh, the Montgomery Advertiser Alabama Journal uh, is what I delivered. And uh, there was a lady singing when the 445 came on, 5 o'clock, Sister A.R. Taylor. And she was singing by herself, walk with me, Lord, walk with me, walk with me, Lord, walk with me. On life's tedious journey, I want the Lord to walk with me. And then she started talking about a program she was going to be at. And then she made announcements and greetings to people that were listening. And then she started singing again. I go, what is this? Singing on the radio live. And that was my introduction to uh, these local gospel radio programs, 15, 30 minutes, like George said, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Um, you would buy the time. Anybody could buy the time. $30 for 15 minutes, $45 for 30 minutes, $60 for 60 minutes. And you could sing, you could preach, you could shout, you could complain, you could do anything you wanted to. And, uh, I was hooked, you know, and that's what I've listened to and been drawn to uh, for most of my life. This is Spiritual Heirs of Hertzboro, Alabama. They had a show on WBIL every Sunday morning for about 35 years, start at 8 o'clock to 8.30. Uh, Robert, Willie, Sam, James, and then Curtis Jordan, the guitar player, the gentleman in the red suit. He wasn't in, he just showed up and they let him sing a couple of songs this this particular Sunday in 2003. Uh, he said his name was Doot, D O O T, Doot. So it's Doot. And they were also, uh, Robert especially, was offended that he was wearing red on Sunday. I don't know what was uh, what was going on there. The gentleman who, behind him, who I whose name I cannot remember, um, was the last uh, member of the Pilgrim Travelers of Tuskegee. They made two records: one for the Designer Record label and one for TSOB, which was Phoenix City label. And his show was an homage to the Pilgrim Travelers he used to sing on the radio uh, every morning. But the members couldn't make it, either passed away, but he kept the show going sort of as a as an homage to uh, the Pilgrim Travelers. His show came on after the spiritual airs. So I went to, drove over to Tuskegee in 2003, Introduced myself to the band, uh, to uh, uh, the group. Uh, and when they finally understood uh, that I was just a fan, you know, of their music, and we became friends, just uh, beautiful gentlemen, uh, every one of them. I started recording them in the studio. And it eventually became, started a record label. That's what we collectors do. How are you going to play, play the music? There's two, two kinds of collectors. There's collectors uh, who invest in records. We, we don't like those people. Uh, okay. How many records do you have, Kevin? How much are they worth? We are no longer friends. Okay. You know, I understand some people are trying to... Uh, trying to uh, uh, start a conversation or whatever, never ask a DJ or collector how many records he has. Not enough, <laughs> you know? Um, 
So, well, how do you get the music out? The good collectors, we want to hear the songs. We don't count our records. We want to hear the music and we're listening to the music and the records pile up. So what, you know? And, but then the other thing is, how do we get this music out? We want to share the music, get a radio show. If you're a collector, get a radio show or, and, or you start a record label. I started a record label, Spiritual Heirs of Hertzboro. They're, they're uh, radio recordings. I have a pile of them here. They're not for sale, but they're free. So afterwards, if you want to come by and get a copy. Also, I have some Isaiah Owens. More on Isaiah Owens here coming up. This is Curtis. Uh, my apologies for the, the kind of uh, quality of the picture here. Curtis worked in a chicken plant all night, and then he would meet the other fellows at the radio station, and uh, he could smoke a cigarette in one toke. He would like, he would, he would light it, and the first time I saw him do this was at a program, a music program in Hertzboro, and of course you can't smoke in church, and he, I walked out with him, and I was asking him stupid questions about how to just tune his guitar, and, and uh, what tunings does he, and he's like standing there, and he lights the cigarette, and it's like, what took so he goes back in the church and he's sitting <laughs> he's the last member of the spiritual heirs that's living you know all the other guys didn't smoke didn't drink didn't do anything and Curtis is still kicking you know and uh but I'm gonna play three selections of uh the spiritual heirs that I recorded uh, I think all of them are on the CD. My Christian friends, my Christian friends, it's now time for the Spiritual Airs Radio Program. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're the Spiritual Airs of Heart Forever singing songs of praise, and we hope that you will enjoy. We've been brought to you each Sunday morning by the Big Time Grocery or by the shop. Tuskegee Ready Mix. We would like for you to patronize our sponsors and let them know how much you appreciate them for sponsoring the spiritual ass on this program. We like to dedicate our program to the sick and shut in within the listening area of this radio station, those who are bereaved and those who are just down and out. We pray God blessing upon you that you may have peace of mind, that you will know that there is a reality in serving the true and living God. Need some encouragement to our church this morning. And pray to Almighty God and fellowship with your fellow man, and God will rescue you from your depths of sorrow that you're in. It's not contemporary gospel or quartet. This is funky, bluesy, raw country gospel music. I am going to tell I'm going to tell on you Oh, yes I am Oh, I'm going to tell somebody Lord, I'm going to tell on you I'm going to tell on you Lord, you grow up and grew I'm going to tell on you They did a couple of country songs, they had a country western song, so it's kind of it sounded gospel, and of course, uh, um, the relationship between black gospel, 1970s style black gospel, and country and western music, um, and uh, soul music, uh, it's not... Uh, what's uh, what's country what's country and western uh, uh, what's gospel about country and westerns what's country and western about gospel uh, 
that uh, the style that these that they've been playing as long as uh, you know the string band era. So this kind of uh, black and white interchange with uh, you know what is country and what is country and Western music, but um, they do two country sounding uh, songs that were in their repertoire. One of them's on the CD, uh, but also they do a, a, a great harmony. Uh, oh. This is Robert. He can sing falsetto and uh, booming bass. were um, recorded in the studio, Steve Grauberger, Center for Traditional Culture. Uh, I bribed him to bring his gear and, and we went about a dozen times over a space about a year and a half and recorded the spiritual air singing in the studio. And uh, that's what those selections are from, mainly doing it. I guess at the time I was thinking about releasing it, but I just wanted pristine recordings of them singing just to be able to listen to it over and over again and to share it with uh, my gospel buddies. Uh, along the same time, I was, does, does anyone know WMGY besides you, George? You don't count. Yes, you know WMGY. Montgomery's longest continuously operating radio station from not, since 1947. Also, it's least known. Isn't that amazing? They have been on 800, right? I, I think George, right? The same 800 AM. Uh, so it's 1947. Nobody knows anything about it. I heard them because they had gospel, 15 minute, 30 minute gospel programs on Saturday and Sunday afternoon, mostly on Saturday afternoon when I moved back from New York in 1997. And I started going up and down the AM dial trying to see if the, hey, is there any some interesting gospel still on, on the radio. And I found WMGY, WZTN had, had uh, uh, stopped broadcasting. Uh, WXVI really didn't have, they had preaching and choirs on Sunday morning. That was about it. There's only so much preaching you can take. So if you need pastors in the yard. My dad's a pastor. He knew what I was talking about. You know, I mean, three hours of preaching, come on. And, uh, uh, but three hours of music is cool. You know, you can listen to three hours of music. But uh, WNGY, it even has Montgomery in its, in its uh, call letters. I took this yesterday on the Upper Wetumpka Road. It's easy to miss. I didn't know that Praise 96.5 was also in the same studios, and which is also WMGY FM. But that's really only uh, recently. Uh, the reason I know about WMGY is when I moved back from New York City, and I was going up and down the radio dial, and I heard my friend Clarence Campbell, local radio DJ, uh, broadcasting, as he would say, babysitting the programs on Saturday. Uh, so I was, I kept listening, and uh, Sister Ann Talbert's Cheerful Angels broadcast, Clarence announced, was coming up. And he played an amazing record, the Montgomery Spiritual Five, Come See About Me, and then the flip side is prayer. Because Ann Talbert's show, like the Pilgrim Travelers of Tuskegee, was an homage to an, the Montgomery Spiritual Five, a great group from the 50s to the 70s that used to have a show on local radio, but all the members had passed away. Ann Talbert was one of their biggest fans, so she kept the show going. She renamed it Cheerful Angels Broadcast. But what was really amazing about it is that she had this gentleman named Isaiah Owens to, that played guitar and sang on the show. And 
when I heard Isaiah playing guitar, I mean, as you will hear, um, he had a unique style. And uh, the next week, I had my cassette ready. I didn't have it ready that, that Saturday. I had my cassette deck hooked up to my receiver. So uh, I could uh, tape Isaiah. And what you're going to hear is the first song. Is the first song I recorded off uh, the radio of Isaiah. And I also made a, a, a CD release of... Uh, of Isaiah's recordings. And uh, uh, this is the first song on the CD. So I'm not trying to sell my CDs. I'm giving them away free. So, you, you know, I can say this without, you know, uh, crossing some ethical line. But after a while, this is about a year, I started going down to the radio station in 1999. Uh, Clarence and I became great friends. He could not believe that I liked Isaiah's guitar playing. He introduced me. Hey, this is my friend Calvin. Everybody called me Calvin McKnight. That was my name. It wasn't Kevin Nutt. It was Calvin McKnight. And so I went with it. So you, you might hear some people call me Calvin. And I'm like, yes. And uh, uh, so he goes, Calvin, this is Calvin. He would introduce me. People would come in um, and say, hey, this is Calvin. He likes Isaiah's guitar playing. And everybody goes, man, you're crazy, man. Nobody likes Isaiah's guitar playing. But anyway, this is Ann Talbert. Uh, uh, she was always late, always. Uh, so that gave Isaiah time to play guitar. She had, the show was 30 minutes. And she, you see she has her Bible uh, and some announcements of upcoming programs, happy birthdays, that type of thing. Uh, really a wonderful person. She was so sweet. And uh, the, the show was sponsored by Joe Tires Repair on Mobile Street. And she would always say, you know how to get there. If you're coming in one way, it's on the left. If you're coming in the other way, it's on the right. <laughs> and I think she was serious. <laughs> So this is afterwards, you can see my little uh, four track cassette recorder here. And I had Isaiah mic'd up. I'm not sure, that might be my mic, I'm not sure. So I was recording Isaiah in the studio, but that first week, that second week, there was a cassette, the first, uh, uh, off the radio, it, this is Isaiah coming up. Clarence will be the first voice you hear. He's it's not tell time for the uh, Sister Ann Talbot's cheerful angels broadcast. Then he will say, she hasn't arrived yet, which he would have to say every week. And uh, Eddie Curtis said, no, the cheerful angels broadcast, Sister Ann Talbot and her angels. Joe Ty Repair, the other one to make it possible each and every Saturday that you hear Sister Ann Talbot and her cheerful angels broadcast. She hadn't arrived as of yet. We'd go to Studio B and join in with Brother Isaiah Owen. It's amazing. Uh, took Isaiah up to New York for a couple of shows in 2005, and uh, he had a great time, and he was much appreciated. Isaiah picked up the guitar because he was kicked out of the Flying Clouds of Montgomery uh, Quartet, released two records on the Savoy record label in the night, 
late 1960s, fabulous group, fabulous group. They thought they needed a younger singer. And Isaiah actually even helped train a younger singer. And then on the very first show, the younger singer bailed on the group. And they went and said, Isaiah, we need you back. And he said, uh-uh. And he never sang with them again. But so he picked up a guitar. He didn't know how to play. And to teach him how to, and he just like, it's all, uh, you know, idiosyncratic brilliance. You know, if you ask me and um, uh, we became very good friends and I did a CD, a free CD, free CD uh, of, uh, of Isaiah's recordings. I'm going to have to skip this. Uh, I have to 12.45. Who's the time master? 12.45? Don't do this. Really? Um, WTSK, 7.90 a.m. in Tuscaloosa. Local on the weekends uh, and during the week. Um, uh, Pay-as-you-go programming, 15 minutes, 30 shows. 30, uh, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. Uh, my friend, uh, my cousin, I'm sorry, my cousin Taylor Watson, curator of the Bryant Museum, the first curator, recently retired. Uh, when I was living in New York, I was like, Taylor, put in, I want some TSK recordings. Just put a cassette in on Sunday mornings. And he did. And they, there was a local group called the Flying Clouds of Tuscaloosa, not the Flying Clouds of Montgomery, Flying Clouds of Tuscaloosa, uh, hosted by Johnny Ray, who had a beauty uh, salon business. And that was the sponsor of the show. So the clip we're going to hear is the flying clouds of, of Tuscaloosa are finishing a song. So all the musicians and singers are in the studio. Uh, and then Johnny Ray has an Easter message uh, for people coming to his salon. And it's kind of long. And then they go back to the musicians and they mention some things. So bear with me. say good morning. We want to talk just a moment or two about control. Easter is next Sunday and I know many people will be going shopping for that special dress, outfit or suit. Those that can afford to do so. Maybe you kind of like John Ray this morning don't have that much money. We really anticipate the Bob and beauty shops to be somewhat busy, especially Friday and Saturday. I'm asking that as many of you that can please try and come before Friday or Saturday. This way there will be more time to work with your hair want to try to work with you, but we need the time. Time is very important to all of us. We don't want to rush over anybody's hair. If rushing is what you want, then we'll rush over it. But my advice to all of us is to give the hairstylists and the barbers a chance to work with you and make sure you get what you want. It's your money and you know what you want to do with it. It takes time and it takes more time to cut and style certain textures of hair. And in all cases, when it comes to chemicals such as perms or curls, the hair must be conditioned before or after, especially the curls need to be conditioned before. Otherwise, they will flop down and look stringy like a mop, too loose and uh, it just all messed up. You have split ends breaking and coming out in the karma picks. And so you have to spend a lot of time working with them in order to, to get them right and or to please people. Anybody can do hair, but everybody don't know hair. Let's support our local licensed barber and beauty shops this year, this Easter, this time around. Uh, don't try to do it yourself or go somewhere, you know, and buy products you know nothing or little about. If uh, you don't want to do business with with Johnny Ray's, then call another beauty or barber shop. Help all of them. I would be crazy to want everybody to come to me because I know I can't do everybody's hair. There are some people who say I'm good and they don't want anybody else but me. 
then there are people who want anybody else except me, you know, so that's just the way it is in life. But we're all in the business and we try to give service. But if you come to me, I certainly won't rush over your hair. I would like for you to call me first. You know, I give you a time to come in so you won't be there a long time. I can't handle crowds. I can handle when it comes to a funeral. But a lot of people coming at the same time for barbershop service, then that's a little different. We don't like working under pressure. And you know, uh, I did a lot of rushing last year, but I made up my mind this year. I'm not going to rush over anybody. If I lose, I just lose. And then this is something I want to ask of the public. And, you know, when it comes to the parents, we'd like for you to control your children then this way I won't have to say anything to them. You know, some people get mad when you say something to the chair, but if you don't say anything, then they get out of control, you know, get out, out of hand. So just please, you know, control them and I won't have to say anything to them. All of the numbers for Janet Ray shops are on page 49 in the yellow page in the new phone directory. Please don't call me about numbers and other people shop number. I don't have a reception. And when you stop me from my work or stuff like that, I get mad. And uh, to just ask for everybody to look in the phone directory. Anybody See, it cost me $200 a month. I show my love. That's reading it's in there. And so it's no point me paying that money if you're all not going to look in the book. And if you want to come, I give you a real nice service. And we have 15 emergency stylists. And this morning, we do have some surprises. We have a gift for Reverend H.M. Merriweather, and we have a gift for Brother A. Amen. Thank you, Brother Simpson. Like I said, don't forget about this all the radio. Reverend oh, Avenue, all those service you know, um, I said you need a good used car, need that car wash, you need a motor worker transmission work done. Go back to the radio. Brother Brown, he give you a good deal. This is Brother Brown, the Reverend Avenue service. You know, and also brought you that Brother Singer this morning. Sponsors. Like I said, tonight, don't forget about the village of Georgia. We're talking about the anniversary of the kingdom. It's all group around. Come on out tonight. Even the commercials are great. You can't tell the songs from the commercials. That's Pam and Mager around the industry. Also to Brother Leon Cotton and Brother Nate Jackson. Not here. Charlie Pulse. Like I said, on the first Sunday night in the... April, Brian Cloud, Big Green Chapel. They do a great version of the old time religion, but it's... I... You know, uh, do we have time? How much time do I have, Scotty? Do I need to? How much? I'm okay. Okay. Uh, anytime I talk about gospel music, you got to talk about the Birmingham Quartet tradition. This is, uh, there's a connection to radio. Bear with me. Uh, if you don't know about uh, Joey Brackner's here, the retired uh, director of folk life, the Mr. Alabama folk life. This is Joey Brackner. For years and years, they did amazing work, starting in the 1980s, really uh, early 1980s, and sponsoring uh, researchers and collectors uh, who were digging in to all these gospel groups, black gospel groups, quartet groups that came out of Birmingham, the Jefferson County area. Really, the first was reformed before World War II. Um, uh, just a mind-boggling number of uh, exceptional quartets and uh, ensembles, uh, family ensembles. And like the Birmingham Jubilee Singers, they were recorded by the top labels of the time, Victor Records, Paramount, Columbia, Decca. They all recorded these Birmingham groups. And when there was a diaspora of these groups going to Dallas, going to uh, New Orleans, Cleveland, and Detroit, and they took this a particular type of Birmingham, Jefferson County harmony blend with them and taught other quartets in all these cities uh, this particular uh, type of harmony blend. It was a very even tone. Where'd they learn it? They learned it before they came to Birmingham to work in the steel mills in the schools, voice culture classes. These voice culture classes, that's what they were called, were taught by Tuskegee University graduates. It was a type of quartet and harmony blend that the Fisk Jubilee, uh, Zach was telling me there was a program about the Fisk Jubilees at the, uh, the Shakespeare Festival recently. I didn't know anything about it. I totally missed it. And, uh, but that type of uh, the Fisk Jubilees, uh, when they've started on one of their first tours in the, in the 1870s to raise money for their college, they had a they had a part of the program. They didn't want to sing the, the spirituals. They came out and they had their type of uh, trained quartet uh, uh, style 
was uh, you know, uh, migrated to the other curriculum departments and in, in music and in, in the historically black colleges and Tuskegee was was one of them. These people would graduate these highly educated music teachers and they taught uh, out in the country, in this case around uh, Selma. And which was a lot of the people that moved to Birmingham to work in the steel mills at the turn of the century. So even though they had gone to different, uh, off and on, uh, haphazardly to different schools, when they were in the company towns, uh, the steel mill company towns, a lot of them were Baptist, most of them were Baptist, um, they came together in churches. It wasn't like their community church where everyone had known each other from, for uh, uh, decades and generations. It was new congregations from different parts of Alabama. And one of the things that connected them together is with the males at least, and uh, well, I take that back. It was everybody. You penalize me for saying that. And I, I should, I will not say that anymore. That the, uh, because there were female quartets, some very good female quartets, especially in New Orleans. And by 1925, um, these quartets were of such high quality. Two reasons. Uh, they remembered the vocal culture, the uh, voice culture classes. Uh, and also, many of these singers went to Parker High School where Fess Watley was the music teacher. There's a book coming out by Bergen Matthews about the history of jazz in Birmingham, uh, where front and center, uh, Thess Watley um, taught the music department, ran the music department at Parker High School. Uh, his influence on uh, music in Birmingham and jazz, really in the United States, he is unsung and cannot be overstated. But he nurtured these groups and then you had the rise, a very interesting phenomena. You had uh, 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 singers who were very good that could sing all the parts, became de facto quartet trainers. Charles Bridges of the Birmingham Jubilee Singers, Sun Dunham of the Dunham uh, Jubilee Singers, and people that wanted to uh, start a quartet would go to Mr. Bridges or Mr. Uh, Dunham, teach us the parts, and he'd sit them down. And they would learn the parts. He would, he would teach them the quartet uh, style, the Birmingham style, very even harmony. 1920, uh, Mamie Smith's Crazy Blues let the record companies know that they were, sold a million copies, that there was uh, a market for gospel blues uh, among people in the South, that they'd spend 75 cents, which was a lot of money for a record. Same thing happened with uh, uh, hillbilly music with uh, Fiddling John Carson in the early 20s in Atlanta. Nobody thought, in the record companies, thought that people would want to listen to this hillbilly stuff and fiddle music. He sold, uh, he made over 200 records in about eight years, you know. Hillbilly records bloom, uh, blues, black gospel, uh, a, a boom in the 1920s. This is the first record recorded by the Birmingham Jubilee Singers. It's the first record recorded by a Jefferson County quartet. And it's one of the first records that was recorded with an electric microphone. Uh, before then, people sang into the, uh, the horns. That's the way it was recorded as well. I mean, they sang it, that's the way you listen to it. You sang into the horns, it went onto the wax disc, the master from the wax disc pressed 78s, and then you listen to it through that same horn. And that's why they had that tinny sound. Microphone technology since electric microphones has not changed since that time. You can go to the radio moments and uh, those great RCA ribbon microphones from the 1930s are highly prized now in recording studios. But in late uh, January 1926, one of the first electronic or electric microphone recorded records, uh, the Birmingham Jubilee Singers, Talent Scout had found them in Birmingham and then freaked out at all the talent. They stepped up to the microphone and this is what they sang. When I was a mourner, I mourned both night and day. My Lord heard me mourning. He took my sins away. When I was a 
sinner, I sin both night and day. My Lord, seen me sinning. He took my sins away. Let me Isn't that beautiful? I was going to play the whole. I know now, Scotty, that we are squinched for time. And uh, 14 other groups from Birmingham recorded professionally in the 1920s and the 1930s. And uh, that style disseminated. I won't be able to play you this. Inslee Jubilee singers from Birmingham, from Inslee, had a radio show in the late 1940s, early 1950s in Birmingham. And some of their biggest fans were Melvin Franklin, Otis Williams, Paul Williams, and Eddie Kendricks. The, the names, The Temptations. The Temptations were huge. They grew up in Birmingham and the surrounding area. They, they were huge Angel Jubilee singer fans. And if you listen to, if you listen to uh, Temptation records, uh, especially, uh, well, even on My Girl, if you listen, you still have the pumping bass which was totally out of style at the time, but the temptation stuck to it. They were huge gospel fans. There's stories about them being late to their package tour shows because they were at the local gospel program, you know? So they took that, uh, they took the Inslee style. This is the only record the Inslee's made. It's very difficult to find. I don't have a copy of this. Recorded after World War II, so it's a little, got a little more sanctified bounce to it. Will I feel better? So much better. And I let my word on down. Well, glory, glory. Hallelujah, yes, I laid my word on down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, yes, I laid my word on down. Well, I'm going home to live with I was worried that I, w I would not have, uh, that I would have too much time, and I we'll have to end it there. So, uh, as best I could do on black, I hope I did the subject well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful program. And we do have time for some questions. If anyone has a question, also, if you're online, you can submit it in the comments and it'll come to my phone. I can ask it for you. Any questions? Oh, we have one over here. Well, thank you, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> so Inslee Jubilee Singers leads me to a question about um, were there were there a lot of these bands? Were there any of these of these groups that made the jump to the new medium of television? Local local broadcast TV maybe? Possibly. Yeah. You know, um, Montgomery had a gospel Sunday morning show on WSFA, uh, which we were on the lookout for. Um, the thing is, is this Jubilee style of singing went out of style about 1960. I mean, people didn't want to hear it. They wanted to hear the more soul gospel kind of sounds. The civil rights era was coming in. They needed something more overtly socially conscious. And it really wasn't until 1980, uh, with the help from the sponsored by the Alabama Center for Traditional Culture, the Alabama Folklife Association, State Council for the Arts, sponsored two quartet reunion programs. It, Birmingham Boys, uh, the quartet anthology Doug Seroff did uh, in uh, 1981 and 1983 at the Coliseum in uh, uh, Birmingham that jump-started the career of a lot of these groups that people had retired, especially the Fairfield Four, who hadn't sung together in... 25 years, and of course that culminated with their appearance in uh, the first scene in Oh Brother. Is that, yeah, 
which I've never watched all the way through. Uh, but, uh, and then the Fairfield Four, they're really singing a lining out, a, a long meter hymn. They're not singing a quartet song in that in the movie. But that's and there's some great YouTubes of the Fairfield Four. Fairfield, even though we were based in Nashville, um, they were from Birmingham and had that Birmingham style. Yeah, so um, yeah, you know, there's some Chicago recordings. Jubilee Showcase uh, was a program that recorded groups, and then also uh, TV Gospel Time. I just remembered those. It's not a lot of uh, TV, but that's had some of the older groups, the Blind Boys. Some of the only footage of a lot of these groups uh, singing live was on those two programs out of Chicago during the 1960s and early 70s. There's a great one of the Soul Stirrers with R.H. Harris, who was the vocalist who preceded Sam Cooke. And by gospel, aficionados was the better vocalist. And that's not dissing Sam Cooke. Uh, that's just how good art and influential R. H. Harris was. Any other questions? Please join me. And oh, one more. Run. I didn't just make any. Person. I didn't make any mistakes, George. Did I? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, and I won't again. You know, I've told you that I flunked out of school listening to James Brown records. Yes, yes. Okay. Another record I listened to at the time was by the Mighty Clouds of Joy. Now, how long have they been around? Because when I heard them, they were just hopped up, energetic, yeah. 70 style gospel with flamingo pink suits and, right. and gold cufflinks. Yeah. Did they start differently? Did they start simpler than that or what? No, they were, they were, uh, most of the group was from uh, Los Angeles uh, at the time, although they had migrated uh, from tech. Their lead singer, uh, finish the thought, migrated from Texas. Their lead singer, Joe Legan, Detroit, Alabama. Yeah, went to LA and became the lead singer of the, Cloud, the Clouds of Joy. They had a more contemporary Pentecostal energy. Uh, take on the quartet sound. Their earliest recordings are some live recordings from 1958. I don't think they were commercially released, but they, they jumped right into that younger kind of sound, that soul kind of Pentecostal sound. Yeah, it's fantastic, man. They were good. They were good. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And you know what? And you know what? That's on the collector's market. That That's that's by far their most uh, um, expensive record. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the soul, now nah, the soul DJs can play it in uh, uh, clubs now, and they do it, especially in Europe. <laughs> Disco never died. It just became house music. Well, of course you guys. Can you tell us about a significant acquisition you have made recently? Recently? Uh, my got, best I think story. you might have a slide about it. Is it? It's a, it's a Leroy record. The oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. One of, one of my holy grails for uh, Montgomery Records was the Montgomery Gospel Heirs. Uh, one morning soon, uh, Foster Daniels, the uh, lead singer who only got to interview once, and he was a homer of names, dates, places, groups, uh, just a great memory. And then he passed away. And uh, uh, it, it, But I could never get a copy of this record. His, his wife had copies, and I... I uh, one of the few times I would go to people's houses and knock on doors. Hey, it's Kevin. I'm looking for that record. And um, and she goes, oh, what's up there somewhere? I'll have to get it, you know. And she never did. And then I started, I left her alone. Surely it's going to uh, show up. It never showed up. No one ever had it. None of the collectors that I knew, researchers or writers, had this record. It's a Montgomery Gospel Air record. They, Kevin, you're in Montgomery. Uh, why don't you have it? And I'm like, I can't find it, man. You know, uh, one showed up on eBay last summer. Oh my gosh. So I put in a bid for like 500 bucks, you know, which, you, you know, I wanted to get this record. That's before I was on budget. And um, 
uh, I got it for like $30. And then I had a problem with the eBay. I had two different accounts, which I didn't know about. And the seller said, hey, hey, the next thing I heard was this case is closed because you didn't pay for the record. So I had sent a note to the, the dealer. Uh, I had no idea where he was at. You know, they don't tell you on it. I said, please. I said, I, I want this record. I, but I didn't see this. You know, you give me like two days and then close the door on me. I didn't hear anything back from the dealer. My gosh, I've been waiting for this record for 30, 30 years, you know. And, and so that Friday, I'm playing records at Leroy, DJ, 9 to 12 Friday nights at Leroy. <laughs> and this guy I'd seen before, you know, he goes, hey, Kevin. And I'm like, hey, oh God, what was his name? Peter or something. I couldn't remember. He goes, uh. I just wanted to make sure you were here because I'm going to bring that record back by next week. I said, what record? He said, the Gospel Airs record. And I said, that was you? He goes, yeah, I didn't want to. He said, eBay would have noted me trying to make a deal outside after, a, you know, so I didn't send you a. Uh. So he was here in Montgomery. Yeah. Yeah. So the next week I could hardly wait. He brought the record. I was freaking out. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I played it. I played both sides that night at Leroy. Some people noticed it was a gospel record. And, uh, uh, but that's how I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll drop in gospel records every now and then. So uh, after 30 years, I finally got the gospel heirs record. So very, very $30 record. And you can't, I wouldn't take $5,000 for it. Well, thank you again. Please join me in thanking Kevin for this amazing presentation. It's all about you. It's all about you guys. It's not me, it's you. Thank you again for a wonderful Alabama Radio moment. I hope to see all of you again next week for Food for a Thought as Victoria Ott will come discuss the failure of her fathers. Thank you. Free CDs. If, anyone wants, if you really want to listen to them, don't get them. Stuck.